Vision Education Class 3, Orientation and Mobility, presented by the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. But before I get started, I want to hear from you if you have anything like a burning issue inside of you, like I want to make sure that I find out about whatever related to orientation and mobility before I leave here today. So if you could think on that for a minute, I'm going to actually sit down here with my pen and paper because I want to make sure that I get to all those things that's burning in your life. <laughs> so does anybody, can anybody think of something you want to make sure we, because it might come from me or it might come from somebody around the table here who says, you know what, here's how I can take care of that. Here's my success story. Okay, um, Thomas, what you got? Thomas, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about communication among us, networking. Um, it, that is cru crucial because I meet up with a friend of mine who is also legally blind, and they talk. We talk about things, new technology, new apps, and so forth. Um, my question for you is, how can we find out the latest item on internet or person we can talk to and the next greatest item that come on in the market. So when you speak about the next greatest item. Yeah. I in, mean, for in, example, like for recent, yeah. most recently, uh, Aerie. Oh, okay. Do you want to tell the folks around the table what you're referring to? Aerie's, um, is an app on your cell phone. Um, it had another person at the other end, and you, your cell phone had a camera, and you point at anything. It could be shopping or medicine and so forth. And the person would tell you if I listen to it. Um, the most recent uh, data I have, the first five minutes is free. No matter how many times a day, the first five minutes is free. Anything beyond that, the tech charge, yeah. Um, why can you offer it for free? Um, why in the store? Um, so when do you use that? What would be an example of when you use that? I'm app? sorry, say that again? Uh, what, could you give us an example of when might you use that app? Okay, let's, let's say you, you want know, color. I'm not sure what color, the shirt time. Uh-huh. The app, hey, what color is my shirt? Yeah. Um, or you go to grocery shopping. And you can't really see where the stuff on the shelf. So you know, and go further right, further right, left. I have not used it in grocery shopping yet. I'm sure it will in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend of mine. She had a glasses with a camera on it and hook it to the phone. Mm -hmm. And she used it for everything, you know, working, what have you, working shopping. Um, so could I give a little bit of feedback on that? Mm -hmm. Has anybody else heard of what he's talking about? No. no. I've heard in the news, that it has been advertised that Wegmans has connected with this company. It's called A-I-R-I. -I, that's the name of it. Mm -hmm. And people pronounce it different ways. I'm not really sure how to say it. But this company partners, they're trying to partner with different um, community places, like Wegmans being a big place in this community. They've also paired with the airport. I think they might also be in Walgreens. And when Thomas says he saw somebody with um, a set of glasses that had a camera on it, mm -hmm. other people are using their phones, but both of those are connecting to a live person. So through the camera in your phone or the camera in the glasses, you're connecting with an agent who's helping be your eyes in a particular circumstance. So it could be related to some kind of a near task, like, okay, I just picked something off the shelf. Well, first, just to find the, 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 the section in Wegmans that you want. Maybe it's looking for signage. So that person will, will be talking back to you, saying, turn your camera a little bit to the left. Okay, now go up vertically. Okay, I see the sign for peanut butter. Yes, aisle number seven. So walk about, you know, 15 feet, and it'll be on your right. You know, so... I'm not clear about each one of you around the table here, how much vision you have, um, or if you have no vision. 
either case, this operator on the other end is going to help you. They're not going to be your mobility instructor. They're not going to teach you how to get around, but they'll kind of put you in the direction of what it is you need to accomplish or find. I talked to this one woman, and she has no vision. She is raising children. She's in a parent, you know, teacher meeting. There's a room full of people, probably about as big as this, because her child is getting all kinds of services. She's wearing these glasses, and before she goes in, she talks to her agent. She says, I want you to also tell me what the facial expressions are around the room in response to what's going on. If someone's rolling their eyes, if someone's shrugging their shoulders and flying their hands around, I need to know this, right? So isn't that an interesting way to use this yeah. service? When it comes, when it comes to uh, what I'm talking with you about, it would probably be, it might be um, at some point like looking and reading a particular sign when you're out walking, you know, getting from here to there and you're using a walking route somewhere around town. It could be when you're in the grocery store, again, it's mostly connecting to signage type of things. Um, and like you said, it is a service that does cost, unless you're in one of those settings Though that organization, like the airport and Wegmans and Walgreens, have said, we'll pay for it. So anytime you're in there, it doesn't cost you anything. Because when you pay for the service, you pay for so many minutes, so much support every month. And it can be very expensive. So I wouldn't even want to speak to how much it is, because they're a relatively new company over the last couple of years, and they're really trying to get the price down so that it's accessible to people. But how would you find out, that's what you mean, like the latest thing that can help me do life with vision loss? There are really a lot of sources out there. I mean, here at our agency, the person, in, if it's technology related, like um, I have technology too. One of my low-tech technology things is if you're trying to mitigate glare, whether it's indoor or outdoor, wear a visor. Okay, so that I would say is like a device, but it's low-tech. Okay? <laughs> Um, but also there are websites, like you could even just, like you say, go to the internet and type in what's the latest, you know, tech device for, you know, people with vision loss or whatever. Have you connected with, there's a, there's a guy who is living with vision loss, he has a particular diagnosis, he's a, he's a husband, he's a dad, and he has this YouTube channel, and he's constantly um, actually reviewing the different, he, he's a technology guy, and he, he loves reviewing for other people with vision loss. Each new item as it comes out, and he, he approaches the companies, he tells them what he does, they lend him the equipment, and there he is talking with you about it. And depending on how much you're visually able to access with what he's doing, he's actually showing you the things. But he can talk you through it as well. He's very accessible. He's really, he's got good sense of humor. And he also then refers you to other folks that are doing the same sort of thing and the companies. And then there are um, national organizations related to vision loss. There's the NFB and the ACB and the... You know, so just you could look up, you know, organizations for the blind, and then boom, 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 they'll all come up. And the, the, the NFB, the National, it might be Federation of the Blind, a lot of people who belong to that have no vision. And they're constant, they're very up to date on the, some of these technology issues. So you might try that one. Sure. Is that helpful for now? Sure. Very good. Anybody else? Did that bring up any other questions in the, in the room? Part of my understanding of why we're even getting together is so that you can understand what some of the resources in the community are to help you as you continue to make your way with vision loss. And I have a specific area that I would love to check in with you about and share some of those resources, including what we have to offer here at ABVI Goodwill. And as we do this, I, I understand there's another component, and that is not just you hearing from me about what's out there to help you as you continue to live life, but how you can learn from one another. So that's the benefit of you all being here around the table with one another. So I'd like to make this conversational. <coughs> if at any point 
you're not hearing me or you're not understanding what I'm saying or the same thing with your peers around the table here I would love for you to stop us because I want us to be all together as we move through whatever we move through in the next hour and a half does that sound reasonable orientation and mobility I'd like to mention what that is to me and then maybe hear a little bit from you what it means to you so the two words we'll start with the first one orientation it's about that question you probably have daily how do I make sense of my environment when I maybe can't see clearly beyond arm's reach so that's about orienting for example just in this room right now where are the people in this room the places in this room like the exit door the things in this room like the refreshments there are a number of skills and strategies and devices for how you can make that happen and that's a lot what we're going to be talking about today but once you figure out you know where everything is and where you know space wise and how do you get from here to there safely I mean, from your chair over to the refreshments or to the exit door there's a lot of obstacles in here at this moment right <laughs> and this translates into you know your home environment when you're out in the community particularly to unfamiliar places and so that's the mobility part of it how do you get from here to there safely and then it also involves transportation now that you know driving is not happening how are you going to get around and stay active in life how are you going to get your food your medicine go to those places you you know regularly commune with others in the community or just how to get out and just be by yourself but be away from home you know so we'll talk about all those things the things that I'm going to bring up here's my focus how can I be part of improving your safety and your independence so the main thing about orientation and mobility which really goes to any kind of um, thing you're trying to do with vision loss is being proactive so with orientation and mobility you usually it's a good idea not to move your feet till you have a plan for how you're going to move them right and then there's all kinds of um, ways that you're going to organize your life so that when you do come up with a strategy a plan a route and it can, the route can be, how do you get up, how do I get up from my chair here and get to the door? Before I ever move my feet, I'm going to take in my environment. I'm going to think about how can I do that most safely. You know, I could just trail the wall here and find the door. Or I could try to navigate and maybe bump into some people or chairs or, you know. So we're constantly assessing, all of us as human beings, um, the risk around us and what our uh, tolerance for risk is so I may say oh I don't I don't really want to bump into any people so I'm going to trail the wall somebody else might say you know I don't care if I you know I'm, I'm gonna there are certain techniques okay um, I am gonna step back for a second when you when you all leave here today my hope is that you'll understand you'll leave with an understanding of what orientation and mobility is that you'll know what kind of services are available here so that you know what kind of a resource we could be to you um, that you get to know Hannah and me a little bit so that in the future if you decided you wanted to reach out to this agency in this particular area of service you know the orientation and mobility you might have a, a little more comfort um, and maybe even confidence in calling us because now we have a little bit of a relationship going um, and who knows you might even leave with a new skill today that you might want to try when you leave here because what I'm going to go over now are some skills um, some devices and some strategies all right so one skill 
that you can hone is self-advocacy. How do you, like everybody in life needs help sometimes, right? Yes. We all need help. We're not, we're not a solo on this planet, right? And a lot of people want to help. But sometimes their help isn't really helping you. Or maybe they don't know how to help you. So for you to get good at articulating when to ask for help and how to ask for it, but also how to refuse it and still be in relationship with someone. Here's an example. <laughs> Have you, has anybody, here's one of the, the uh, techniques, okay? Uh, sometimes you're in a situation, particularly if it's an unfamiliar situation, and you maybe struggle with depth perception. If both of your eyes are not working well together, or maybe uh, that can play with how close or how far I am from something. Or maybe I see a line of contrast coming up. And, and it's really, I'm on the dark rug right now, and I'm going to go toward the, um, the linoleum in the kitchen. Okay, I'm going from the living room to the kitchen. But it's in an unfamiliar place. And I, if I see that line of contrast, I might say, ooh, maybe there's a step there, right? So you got to figure that out somehow, right? Well, we have a, some ways to do that. But let's say you're in an unfamiliar place, so you said, you know what, there's a lot of people around, I don't know this place, um, could I hold on to you? Or they might say, oh, here, let me help you, and they grab you, and they hold on tight, and they start pushing and pulling. <laughs> have you had that experience ever? Yes. <laughs> so it's really scary, right? Because they have an idea, they think they know what's going on, but you're clueless as to their thinking. Sometimes they're telling you, but sometimes they can't get the words out soon enough and they're already pulling you in a direction that, or the, at a pace that it's just not comfortable, right? So we call this technique sighted guide or human guide. And the, the key part of this is you are the one who's in charge of whether you're connected to your guide or not. So not them holding on to you, but, and so that if they grab you and they start that, you can say, you know, I do a lot better if I hold on to you. And then what you would do is you would follow this technique if it worked for you, which is, um, would anybody be willing to be, uh, uh, do it with me right now? It would be standing up and just walking around the room for just a minute. Okay, Mary Lee, she's popping right up here. She's to my left. All right, so Mary Lee, would you have a comfort level for me being better on your right or your left as we... My right. Okay, so I am to her right, and I'm going to suggest that you... Um, I'm going to just take the back of my hand, and I'm going to find the back of her hand. So I'm the one with the vision, and I want to connect with her, but I don't want to be too um, familiar. You know, this is kind of intimate, right? So um, I want to let her know I'm here and I'm ready. And what she's going to do then is trail up my arm until she finds my upper arm just, you know this one, Carl? I heard you say yeah. She's going to find just above my elbow. Now, I'm going to ask her to hold this upper arm in a certain way. I want her to hold it like she's holding a can of something, all right? So the thumb is going to come around one side and the fingers on the other because that's how she's going to stay connected if we get a little jostled. She's got a good grip but she's not putting a tourniquet on me, right? I'm jostling my, my arm and she's kind of finding, oh yeah, I don't have to hold that tight, this is good. I just want to make sure we're always connected. Very welcoming to me and I was trying to clean up after myself in the kitchen and at one point I saw this, this glass over by the stove. And I thought, well, that's precarious. Uh, maybe I should take care of that. But then I also knew to ask. And he said, oh, no, that's where I always keep my glass, right? And I said, okay, not touching it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But let's say he's going to find that glass. He knows exactly where it is in the kitchen in that it's by the stove. It's that there's this little slender uh, countertop right next to the stove, right? So he knows it's always going to be there, and he always he knows it's always going to be toward the wall along that you know rectangular strip of countertop, right? But when he goes to get it, he has no vision. So if he just like reaches his hand out, he's probably going to knock it over. So there's something called organized search, right? So 
what he might do is get himself to that part of the kitchen, and there's actually a wall there, and he uses his, like Mary Lee was using, her upper protective technique, so he finds the wall, he trails down the wall till he hits the countertop, and then because the glass is a, is a glass that is vertical, right, he's then going to very gently move his hand horizontally across until he very gently comes in contact with the glass and then picks it up and drinks or goes and just whatever with it. So that thing about having an organized way to do it. Otherwise, he might just knock it over, right? Does that make sense to you all? And are you yes. doing things like that already? <laughs> it happens. No, no. Okay. okay. All right. Um, here's another thing. Um, so let's say I wanted to walk around this uh, room and find an empty chair at the, table, at the table with you guys. So I might stand up. And something I might do, nobody in the room might notice that I'm doing it, but it's really huge for me. I'm going to trail the, 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 the edge of this table that I'm at right now because I have some vision. I'm guessing a lot of you have some vision. Is that right in the room? Okay. So the key is to utilize all of your senses as you're going about being organized and ex creating and executing strategies. So right now I have some understanding, let's say, of the visual of this room. Like we, I know there's a rectangle of, I can see these like dark sweaters over here and I think there might be a person over there because for example, Beth, you're, you're, you're wearing a sweater that is blending in. It's the same color as the cabinet behind you. Uh -huh. And then guess what? The floor, is the rug is dark and your pants are dark. So I might not see you at all, depending on my vision you know, level, right? And so I might think there's nobody at that end of the table. And then I look over here and I see a, a light colored background with dark tops on the three people sitting here. Sure enough, I'm guessing there's, I can't really tell how many people, but I know there's some people over here. So I'm putting that together in my head. And then I'm thinking uh, also, that I want to get to a, an empty spot because you all have told me there's some empty spots but you didn't tell me exactly where. So I'm going to go along and I'm going to trail. I might, I'm, I want to have my vision up and scanning, right? Like an organized way of scanning this room to know as I walk, as I execute this route. I'm going to go, here's my route. I'm going to go counter, let's see, no, I'll go, count, I'll go clockwise around the table until I find an empty seat, okay? Now, I want to, not be touching people or knocking things off the table as I go. I want to try to have straight lines of direction as I go. So if I trail this stationary table, which has a really nice straight line of direction, I can first turn my body so that it's parallel to the direction the table's going, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, instead of, you know, going on top and kind of heading along here, it's kind of awkward socially, right? But if I just take my little pinky or my ring finger and I put it up against the side of the table here and I actually I'm going to make it precede me. I want it to tell me when this table is going to end. If I did it at the same, you know, like parallel to me, we'd find it together. But I'm going to have it out front and then all of a sudden my hand kind of swings free. I'm at the end of the table, so I'm still going to follow it. And then I'm going to find the next table, and then I'm going to go along. And I've just found the arm of Mary Lee's chair. And oh, I found her elbow. I say, oh, excuse me. And then I go around the back of her chair. Now, I could be on top of her chair, but then I'm probably going to be touching her back. Maybe she has long hair. I'm going to get my hand stuck in her hair. So I'm just going to have my pinky again, or maybe even wherever my arm touches the back of her chair. So that's keeping me in the line of direction I want to go. And then I'm feeling the next chair, and the next chair, and I'm kind of seeing and, and hearing and smell. You know, use all of your senses. I know there are people here. I can feel the warmth of their body even, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I feel a, a whole lot of nothing here. So I say, oh, is anyone sitting here? And you guys say, no, take a seat. Do you, know? you know what I mean? So strategies that are going to get me where I want to go safely and help me connect with people versus disconnect. So we just talked about how you can align your body parallel or perpendicular 
to stationary surfaces and use those to help set your straight line of direction. When you're out on the streets walking around, you're going to be listening for the flow of traffic, right? And you want to, if you're on a sidewalk, you want to be setting yourself parallel to that line of traffic that you're hearing and seeing. Then when you get to an intersection and you want to cross a street, you're going to be paying attention to that perpendicular traffic and you want to hear it and see it stop, right, before you would ever step out into the crosswalk. I mean, there's a whole lot of strategies for how to analyze an intersection and how to get across safely. But I think you're getting the point is there are strategies. You're using all of your senses. When you think about sight and hearing and then your sense of touch, a lot of times you think sense of touch with my hands, but it, but it can also be my feet and what my feet find, right? Like I just bump my toe, what is it? I don't even have to look down, I could just sort of, you know, tap around with my foot. And I'm going to use my understanding of context. Like I got my hand on the top of the table, so it's probably, you know, the leg or the foot of the table that I'm feeling. So. Context becomes really important when you're in an unfamiliar place and you're trying to make sense of it. If you, if you um, enter a building, oftentimes, like a doctor's office building, pretty soon after you enter, there's probably going to be an elevator if there's more than one, one level. And usually wherever there's an elevator, there's also a, a set of stairs, right? Maybe it's enclosed, maybe it's wide open. So these are all things you're going to put together to come up with some strategies on how to make sense of that environment and get around safely and where you want to go. The other day I was with a man who has had vision loss for a lot of his life and recently he had another drop in vision. And he just moved. So he's trying to get to know this new environment. So as he's coming up with his mental map, we're just beginning inside of his apartment. And his apartment is, I would say it's a studio. Even though half of it is somewhat sectioned off by this kind of makeshift closet, right? But it's basically one room. And there's a kitchen and a living area and a bedroom and a bathroom. And it's one of those kitchens where the cabinets come down and then they stop. And there's all this space. So you can see through from the kitchen to the living room through this space. And then there's the countertop. Does that make sense to you as I'm saying that? So here's what's happening. Whenever he tries to get to the kitchen, there's this corner that seems to be like floating in space, right? This sharp corner. And it's right at his eye level. He keeps bumping his face on this thing. So we kind of brainstormed together. How could he get around his apartment when he really can only, at this point, he can only see like shadows kind of thing, like bright light and dark? Well, one of the things is maybe he could take a different route. So any route, whether he's coming from the bedroom or the living room or coming in, inside from the, you know, entering the apartment, take a route that is away from that danger, <laughs> right? Trail the wall on the other side, right? Or he really, likes to, he really likes to go there near that. So I said, well, what if you trailed up, up above? You know, so you're actually holding on to that wall so you can find that corner with your hand before your face ever hits it. And then as you go to turn the corner, all of a sudden, your arm becomes a marker for distance of how far you have to go around it so you don't bump it. I mean, it sounds really simple, but when you're so overwhelmed with the whole creating a new map kind of thing. Okay, there's another thing. He has his TV on a lot. So he's got a big screen TV. And so he can hear it, and he can sometimes sort of make out certain things on it, but he definitely sees the light, the bright light of it. And he also hears the sound of it. 
So sometimes he thinks he's headed toward the kitchen, but he's really headed toward the bathroom. And I said, and then he gets all disoriented and anxious, right? And I said, well, when you get like that, freeze your feet. Listen. Where's the sound of that TV? If that TV is coming from behind you, you're heading toward the bathroom. If it's on your left, if you keep going straight, you're going to find the kitchen. But this could be any of your senses. It could be like when you're, even sometimes people in their apartments, they have this one big window and the sun's coming through. So it could be wherever the light source is. Maybe you're feeling heat from the sun. So your sense of touch is also, you know, that warmth of the sun on your skin. If you're walking down the street, you're following a line of buildings, then all of a sudden whoosh comes a big whoosh of air. Maybe it's an alleyway, or maybe it's a, uh, you're coming to the street corner. So you're going to feel that on your skin, right? And then, you know how when you are leaving a doctor's office building, you're going out the front door, you're going to the sidewalk, you want to head up, you know, across the parking lot to a vehicle? Oftentimes there's a blended curve, or the, you know, the curve that there's a decline, and all of a sudden the curve is you know, flush with the, the driveway there. So you're going to also feel, you're like your sense of, it's where your body is in space. You're going to feel yourself going down that decline. And then have you ever noticed those bumpy, um, those bumps that are on the, yeah, I see you, Kelman. <laughs> yeah, so that those are for people with vision loss. Did you know that? No. no. If you ever feel those under your feet or see them coming, oftentimes it'll be this rectangle of these bumps. They're called truncated domes. The whole thing is called a detectable warning surface. Sometimes they're of a highly contrasted color with the sidewalk. Sometimes they blend right in. They can be made out of really hard plastic. They can be made out of just like imprinted in the sidewalk. And they're there to tell you that once you detect those, if you end up walking to the other side of them, you're going to enter vehicular traffic. So you're leaving the sidewalk, you're going into either a loop where cars come and drop people off in front of that office building, or maybe if you're at the corner, you know, a traffic light corner, you're going to step into traffic. If you are going from one corner to another at a traffic light, those come in handy because you leave one set of them, you go across your um, crosswalk, and then once you feel your feet hit the opposite side, there they are again, you say, I'm at the sidewalk, right? So these are tactile cues, they're uh, visual cues. So whenever you're putting your mental map together, you're bringing all of your senses and any kind of cues or clues into that. And that's when you plan a route, you're going to think of, okay, I, I know if I get to here, then I can get to there. And then once you start executing your route, you're going to use those clues as information to confirm that you, where you want to be along your route, right? So dynamic or ongoing orientation. But there's another thing, landmarks. Think about how a landmark and a cue might be different. Like in this room, there's this smart board to my right. And it's got these feet that are coming out at the bottom and it's on rollers. There's only one of these in this room. So once, you know, like you guys have been coming here a few weeks, whatever, and let's say, Carl, you come toward me because you want to, you know, come this end of the room to get out the door, whatever. You might knock into those feet one time because they're the same color as the rug, right? So if you did, you might stop for a minute and you might say, where am I? Oh yeah, there's the, okay. So once you know and recognize this landmark, which for you might be visual because it's got the big white screen, but it kind of blends in with the white wall, so maybe not. Maybe it's just that bumping into it with your foot and you say, oh, there's that smart board again but you know exactly where you are in this room because there's only one of those, right? So a landmark, it can be something visual. 
It can be something that you hear. Um, I'm trying to think. Here's an example. So when that man that I was just at his place, he just moved, right, he had a recent vision loss. We also left his apartment. We went downstairs because he needed to know the route to get to the mailboxes. Well, the mailboxes are right across in the same hallway with a with a five uh, like a whole bank of um, snack machines and drink machines, which are constantly humming, right? So unless there was a blackout, he's going to hear that humming. So as he's going down the hallway, that's one of the landmarks, the auditory landmarks he's going to be listening for to know that he's getting close to where he has to turn to go to the mailboxes. There was another time where I was with an 11-year-old out in front of her school, and we were taking an outdoor route, and it happened to be a windy day. And she knew that she had to turn left to get to the main entrance if she heard the flag waving. You know how you can hear that whipping around up there? Now we could hear it that day, but what if it wasn't a windy day? So that's one of those auditory clues or cues for her. Whereas if, she, if her cane, as she was sweeping it back and forth, hit the flagpole, you know, that's a landmark because it's always going to be there, right? So I'm looking at the clock. It's 11 o'clock right now, so we have 30 more minutes. I just want to check in if I could hear some voices around the room. Am I on the right track? Is this helpful? Yeah. I'm seeing some yeses. Oh, see all yeses. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So is there anything that's coming up? We have 30 more minutes. I got more to share, but is anything in your minds that you want to make sure we address as a group? I just want to ask you one question. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah. say a person can see, um, you know, um, they can't see, they just see colored light, and they have to go across the street. Yes. I want to know how do they know. Oh, okay. Yeah, if the cars have stopped. Right. So are you saying that they wouldn't be able to necessarily look at the traffic light and know what's going on? Right. right. They wouldn't necessarily be able to look at the pedestrian signal and know what's going on. And they're the only ones standing there. How would they? Yes. Okay. So there, there are a lot of strategies. In general, you do have to have pretty, if you're not being able to connect with things visually, you do need to have good hearing. Because then you, what you're going to do is you're going to listen for the flow of traffic. And you may have to just stand there a little bit and hear the whole cycle of how the lights change, right? Mm -hmm. Because you might be at a traffic light that's pretty simple, right? It's, it's, let's say it's a main road, like Lake Avenue, all right? Right. And because I was here with this guy the other day, we're doing Lake Avenue. And then he's got some minor streets. The light doesn't change for the minor streets until that controller detects yeah, I see Calvin shaking his head. Detects that there are some minor street cars that need to come out. To come out right? Mm -hmm. So we're watching that happen. This this particular, uh, oh, what were we going to say? Okay, you go across the street, right? You got to remember some side thing. You could turn on red. Yeah, that's right. Yes. You get hit. Mm -hmm. Boom. Right. Because sometimes those cars who are thinking about that right turn on red, all they're thinking about is they don't want to get hit by that green light traffic on Lake Ave, they're going to jut out in front of you, you know? They're, they're not looking for people, right? So there's a lot of strategies for how to be like a defensive pedestrian, <laughs> right? You could be wearing, uh, I don't know if anyone's able to visually connect with this, I'm holding up in front of me a reflective vest that is a bright yellow with the stripes on it that are reflective when they hit the headlights or any kind of light, okay? Um, we also have, like, in the winter time, it can get pretty icy and slippery, but a lot of times you are going to be walking around because you're not going to be driving, and you might have some familiar routes that you feel comfortable with. I'm going to pass these around and hand one to you, Carl. And I'm going to hand one to you, Marilyn, and after you check it out, pass it on. These are called yak tracks. 
It's just one of many different types of devices. You, what you do is you stretch it across the bottom of your shoe or your boot, and it grabs on and it's stuck on there. So when you're out and about in snow and ice, it could be slippery leaves or mud, it's going to help you stay upright because it grips instead of slips. Now, you don't use these indoors. You've got to put them on right when you leave your house. And when you go, you know, get to your destination, you've got to take them off. So I carry, I, I wear these. You, um, yeah. I carry around like a little plastic bag, or it can even just be a grocery, you know, plastic bag, because they'll be dirty and they'll be wet, but you want them with you. So, um, all right. So, also, there are three kinds of canes that we um, dispense here, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pass them around so you can get them in your hands. The first one is something. They, they all have something in common. They all have a white shaft with a little bit of red toward the tip. And supposedly, the, the, we all know that <laughs> if you see somebody walking with a cane with a white shaft and a red tip, that means they have a vision loss. But right. truly, not everybody knows that. You might have to be an ambassador for people with vision loss and help people explain. Right? Yeah, go ahead, Alice. Um, they don't have dogs with them anymore? Okay, so that's another device, right? Okay. A dog could be, instead of a human guide, you could have a dog guide, right? Okay. Now, to, to get a dog guide, you already have to be an independent traveler. You, because the dog is not going to know where you got to go. You got to give commands to the dog. Well, how does he know to cross your street? Cross your, cross your street? The dog does not know when it's time to cross the street. You okay. tell the dog. That's a really good question. Yeah. Now, what happens is the dog is also trained that if you give the command to cross the street and all of a sudden something dangerous comes off, come, happens in the midst of the, you know, that can happen, right? Right. The dog will override your command and start and make the team safe, right? Yeah. But you are the one, like Carl was saying, how do you know when to go? Maybe there's a, maybe the dog might be able to help out in that right on red situation, you know, if somebody starts to mm -hmm. go in, right? Because you've said, oh, okay, uh, you've done all your assessment and you know it's time for you to go, and then somebody does what they're not supposed to do, and you can't see that with a dog cat. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to pass this one around. We'll start with Carl here. Be, I want you to be careful because at the there's a there's a handle at the top, but at the bottom there is a kind of a sharp thing that's like residing on the shaft of the cane. You can push the, some buttons here and you can make it go in place and what's happening now is there are some spikes that are on the bottom that will help you. This cane is for balance. It's not for detecting things. I'm going to give you a couple of other canes that might do that, but this is just for somebody who's already using a support cane that has probably been dispensed by a physical therapist, we might change it out for this one because now it's not only going to keep you and give you that support, but it's going to tell the community that you have a vision loss. So that's this one. And then remember when we talked about getting guidance from somebody, you know, like the sighted guide? Sometimes if that's happening, you might carry this other cane. I've got it in my hands right now, and it is like about 10 inches of five different segments. It's all folded up. I'm going to come over here, step here, Carl. It's going to make kind of a noise here because I'm going to unfold it. It's on a tension rod and it just pops right into place. This one is very thin. It's not meant to hold your weight. It's called an identification cane. So you might hold this up by your side. The tip is off the floor. Um, I'm holding on to my sighted guide and I'm, I'm holding this while we're walking as a team. That way, everybody around us, if they understand what this cane means, will very likely get out of our way and give us right. lots of room, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I hold it in front of my body, only people coming at us are going to know that I have a vision loss. If I hold it a little bit out to the right, people from behind, front, and either side are going to be able to see it. So I'm going to pass this. Carl. There are some people who have enough vision that they really don't need a, like a long cane sweeping back and forth going down the road, but they might carry this identification cane so it lets people around them know 
particularly if you have um, a visual condition where you have a loss of field. Some people, um, you know how, like, I'm going to put my arms, like, stretched out to my sides, and that's, when you think about peripheral vision, even if I'm looking straight ahead, like right now I can't see my hands, but if I start moving them toward one another, now all of a sudden I can, without looking at them, they're in my peripheral vision. Well, sometimes vision loss starts to take away that peripheral vision, right? So all of a sudden, now I've got my hands out like Frankenstein, maybe I have a vision loss where I can't see anything outside of my hands. I can only see what's in between. So I've lost that field of view out to my right and to my left. So if I'm looking straight ahead, hey, I can see pretty good. So I'm walking down the hallway, and then somebody's coming up by me, and I don't necessarily hear them. Maybe there's a lot of noise, and I get kind of startled because all of a sudden, there they are, you know, right in my personal space. For example, I was with a man the other day. We were out in front of his apartment, and he lived off near Monroe. We were on the sidewalk, and we were talking and he's actually, he has a hearing loss and a vision loss. And his hearing loss is profound. So he had his back to the sidewalk and there were some people coming up from behind him. He had his interpreter like in front of him so that he could see what she was saying. And he was focused on her so his eyes were straight ahead. He has a huge field loss in his periphery. So some folks started coming around. They actually went on the grass to get around him, not knowing that he had vision loss or anything. He wasn't carrying a cane or anything. And he's just new there, you know, trying to make friends, right? Uh. So this guy passes him, and they, they collide. Like, they kind of bump into each other. And this guy turned at him and really let him have it. He couldn't hear him. He was in that field of view that he'd lost, so it was as if he wasn't even there. <coughs> and he didn't even know that the guy got so upset, because the guy just said a little something and walked on. And the interpreter said, and so then I, this was a great learning experience, right? Because, Mary Lee, I'm going to go ahead and take that identification cane. If he were standing there with this identification cane, you know, as we were talking, that person from behind would have seen it. Or even if he had it in front, and, and, but then when the guy turned to cuss him out, he would have seen it and he probably would have said, oh, I'm sorry, you know? Mm -hmm. So this cane helps you connect better, you know, when you're out in public, right? And you don't have to tell your whole story. You don't even have to have a conversation with anybody. You're just holding it and there's communication that goes, that helps you guys do, you know, everybody get done what they need to get done. And he's one that, he has very good vision, but it's, it's limited. His field of view is so limited, right? So, and he's a young guy. He's like 30. And he's, he just doesn't, he doesn't want to use any canes. He doesn't want anybody knowing, you know? But stuff well, like, oh yeah, go ahead, Cindy. Um, Sylvia. Uh, one of the things that I've been told is that people sometimes don't want to be identified because they might be victimized because of being, mm -hmm. um, having lost sight. So how, that's, how would you deal with that's that? That's a really good point, and I'd love to talk about that right now. If that's, is that folks around the table want to hear about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's think about if you, if you did not have a vision loss, and you're planning your day, and you want to go someplace, you're going to make some decisions that impact your safety. Like, I'm going to go here, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go here, I'm not going to go at midnight. I'm going to go here when there are more people around because if there are more people around and there are more eyes on me, the, the less likely I'm going to be a victim of a crime. Same thing if you have a vision loss. The more eyes on you, the less likely somebody's going to get away with something, right? But there's another part of it, and that relates to the services that we're talking about here today, the orientation and mobility services. You've already seen how some of these techniques help people to see you as confident and competent. And people who are looking for victims, they're looking for someone who is like looking down at their phone, you know, not really paying attention to the environment. That's all you guys do is constantly, you know, <laughs> check out your environment, right? And a lot of times people, when they see, and I'm just going to open it up, I've got that long white cane. 
And it's going to make a noise here. And I am going to pass this over to you, Carl. Um, it's, you'll notice it's a little thicker than that last cane, but not as thick as the first one. You're not, it's not to hold your weight. It, does, it is foldable, so you, you, know, you can bring it out when you need it and when you don't. And check out the tip near the red. It's got a rolling tip. Okay. While you're out there and you're, you've got your cane going back and forth, right? You're going to be using different strategies to, to move through that space and you're going to be very organized and, and that's going to come across. So you want to be well trained in how to navigate spaces so that as people look at you, they make assumptions about, ooh, I'm not touching that one, that person knows what they're doing, right? So does that make sense to you, those strategies? Okay. You see how, are you able to... Um, yeah, I feel those bumps okay. on the road. Yeah. And what about this, this change of color here? How uh, there's a light, I don't know, are you see the bright light from the sun? Yeah. All right, so my point is if you're in an unfamiliar place and you see that change of contrast, you need to check it out. It could be a pothole, it could be a, not inside, but here and like that. Mm -hmm. It could be a step or something. You, know, you, mm -hmm. just want to, you just want to confirm, and if you didn't have your cane, you might be doing it with your foot, you know, mm -hmm. but boy, that looks a little awkward, and mm -hmm. sometimes it can get you off balance, and what if it were a deep step or something, right? right. Or like you had to step down a step. Yeah. yeah. I missed a step one time and yeah. it fell. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so this mm -hmm. cane, is out in front of you, Alice. If this cane is out in front of you like two and a half, three feet. Uh -huh. You're swinging it back and forth, all of a sudden, boom. You feel it in your, your hand goes down, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the point is, it tells you so that you have enough time and space. Right. And what you do is you, you'd use it as a marker. You'd hold it right there, and then you'd walk up to it. And then you could kind of explore what's going on here. Is it right. one step? Is it several steps? I then fell down because I didn't know it was a step. Yes. And then uh, one time it was in the winter time last year I was going to Macy's, there was a step, but I was running my mouth so that I understand. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. fell everybody got <laughs> my face and everybody said, oh, Are you all right? Gosh. I said, Yeah, I was yeah. fine. Uh -huh. I was more embarrassed than right. because right. I shouldn't have been running my mouth. I should have been watching looking down. Oh, to step and up. you just made a good point. This cane if you learn to trust it, it's going to tell you things so you don't always have to be looking down. So you can actually have your head up and see, hey, what's coming next, right? That's why uh, my head was up and... Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So, so that's another thing. So each one of these canes have a different purpose. If you have enough vision that... You might not need constant contact with the ground in a preview. You might take that identification cane, that thinner one, and just pull it out when you need to explore. Or when you're in an unfamiliar place and you want people around you to know, I have a vision loss. Because when you don't have this out, like that man on the sidewalk who couldn't hear or see the person coming around him, you know, it just made for an unpleasant situation. And it didn't need to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, glare. Can we talk about glare a little bit? Mm -hmm. So in this room, is anyone is experiencing like the lighting is just not, whether it's the natural stuff coming through the window? Did I see Kim? You raise your hand. Which is it? Is it the overhead lighting? The windows yes. are both? Both. Combination. Okay. Mm -hmm. Combination. And I noticed that the, the glasses you're wearing have a tint to them. Yeah, it's still not enough. It's but still not enough. And I'm wondering, do you mind if I come close for a minute? I want to see, oh, I can see it from here, I think. So there are tinted glasses that have kind of a shield on the top and a shield on the bottom. So I'm wondering, well, I have a pair. Do you want to just try them real quick? I brought some, some glasses. For example, I, it's kind of, what would you call that color that you, that you have there? A purple. A purple? OK, so I have one. I, I'm calling it a plum. You, well, can, you can actually put it over the glasses you have on just for fun. Okay. These glasses that Kim is putting on right now, they have a shield on the top, the bottom, and the sides. So that instead of this overhead lighting coming, you know, like I'm looking around the room, everybody has glasses, including me, well, those that are wearing glasses, where the light can come and reach your eyes because there's nothing keep, 
Wait, do you have the shields? You do have the shields, don't you, Thomas? <laughs> you just put one. Okay, yeah. Does that make a difference, Kim? The shield on the top right now, or? Um, a little bit. So do you want to just keep those rolling around, pass those around? And I'm going to pass another pair around that is a different color. So as you try these on, if you're willing, you don't have to, but um, you can wear them over the glasses that you have. They come in different color families. There's yellow, orange, plum, there's just, and on and on and on. And what people will do is they put them on and some of them say, oh, it's like a balm. You know, all of a sudden they don't have to squint so much. And sometimes they say, like when these, these yellow ones come around maybe, but I think it also happens with the plums. If you look at something that generally is pretty blurry, sometimes it comes a little more into view, like um, a little, the contrast is improved. <laughs> okay. So, if you've ever seen anybody wearing sunglasses indoors, this might be why. You might have something going on with their vision that they're very sensitive to light. And so, some of those um, outdoor sunglasses, like here's an example of one, um, they have the shields on them too. So, you want to just check those out. There's one thing we haven't talked about, transportation. So, in general, I want you to know that every county in New York State has an Office of the Aging, and every Office of the Aging has a um, transportation specialist. So if you are not driving, you can call them, and it's, it's called New York Connects, and I think it's in the, is it in the notebooks there? There's one number you can call, because there's like 17 pages of options out there these days on transportation options. And instead of me trying to tell you all those right now and they might not even be up to date, there is this one number that you can call. New York Connects, because it is one number for Monroe County. And what you do is you tell them, you say, you know what, I need ideas on how to get to uh, my senior center, how to get to my church, how to get to where I get my hair done, you know, where it can be to go to my friend's house, you know, it's whatever you want to do. And then instead of you having to visually, they don't even have it online anymore because there's so many parameters to each one. Like this one is church related, but they'll take you anywhere in Monroe County, but they only do it on Mondays and Thursdays oh. from nine to three. And, <laughs> and they don't, doesn't cost anything. But then there's like, there's something called the star program. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. That's related to Catholic charities. And that one is people really can depend on and have had really good luck with. And they, I, what is it you want to mention? I'm sorry, I didn't know your name. Oh, sorry, I'm Carmona. I used to work hey, for Catholic Family Center and do Catholic Charities. And okay. so star program, they, they take you uh, grocery shopping, they take you to a doctor's appointments. Um, you just call in advance to kind of set it up and they can do it ongoing. You give me your appointments in advance. Have you got to be a Catholic? No. <laughs> Some of them are if you're only members of their church. Yeah. Some of them are only if you're in the zip code. Like there's something in Brighton and Penfield called Bride Pen Senior yeah. Volunteers. Yeah. Do you have to have uh, a, a, a doctor's note or eye test? Did you they truly do indeed need this vision? No, because it isn't just for vision loss, a lot of these options. Okay. It's for anyone, for whatever reason, they're not driving. Yeah. Okay. Now, it is for seniors in general, yeah. and then if you're younger, then... Disabled. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's just yeah. you're not able to drive. Okay. Now, then, also in our community, and this is how it works all across the United States, if your community has a, a public uh, bus system, and you are not able to for whatever reason, and maybe it's because physically you can't wait at a bus stop, or um, you can't walk that far, you, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's visually, you can't yeah. connect with the schedules, you know, um, you, can't, what, you can't even see the bus signs when you're near a bus sign, you yeah. can't see, whatever. For whatever reason, you can't use a fixed bus route system, there's another system that's related to the buses. It's called RTS Access. Has anybody heard of that? Kim's shaking, yes. It used to be called Lift Line, if you know that. But it is a new, it's called RTS Access. And that is one that you do have to apply for, and you do have to have some kind of documentation of whatever your ability is that keeps you from using the fixed bus service. So it might be, it might be uh, like we will help you fill out that application. 
Um, it is not able currently to be done online, but we have worked it out with them that I can email it to them. They want a picture, they want um, a signature that says everything is correct. You answer 12 questions, which are very detailed, <laughs> and I would say rather tricky because they're saying, can you walk nine blocks? Well, let's, yeah. let's say you say, I am physically able to walk nine blocks. You can't just say that. You just have to say yes or no or whatever. Right. Um, but think about it. If you walk nine blocks, you're probably going to have to cross a street somewhere. Yeah. Maybe that street is a busy you know, traffic light intersection. Are you able to currently do that? Now, there are, with training, maybe you could do that. But if you don't have training right now, you need that service, right? Yeah. And maybe... You would never be able to do that for other, like, co-things going on with you, right? So, um, anyway, they would review your application, and if you do it through us, and you give us permission, you know, we can tell them what your visual acuities are, and that helps them understand that you have vision, you know, that you're legally blind, or you have low vision, or whatever. Um, so that's why we can help in that way. And then also, like if you're going grocery shopping and you need a little bit of support, a lot of the places you can go to customer service, yeah. like Wegmans. All right, everybody. Thank you.